this evening, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing two speakers whom I got to know fairly recently. Their work on uh, the United States in particular and aspects that concern Jews and anti Semitism. And I think that they are going to provide us today with a rather different and original perspective on certain aspects of American society and particularly of the American Academy which have been either neglected or have not been analyzed in depth. And these two presentations, although at first sight you might not immediately recognize connecting threads, I'm confident that they will emerge in the course of the evening. The first speaker is Professor Stephen Norwood, who is Professor of History and Judaic Studies at the University of Oklahoma, and who received his PhD in history from Columbia University. In the course of his remarks, you may note that he has some important things to say about Columbia University in the period that he's going to be focusing on. He's the author of four books and the co-editor with our second speaker tonight, Professor Yunus Pollack, of the two-volume Encyclopedia of American Jewish History, which was published in 2008 and which won the Booklist Editor's Choice Award. Stephen Norwood's most recent book, and the one on which he will draw primarily tonight, is a very important breakthrough book in terms of examining the record, the rather grim record, one has to say, of American elite academic institutions in the 1930s with regard to Nazi Germany. The book is called the Third Reich in the Ivory Tower, Complicity and Conflict on American Campuses, and it was published by Cambridge University Press in 2009, and was a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award in the Holocaust Studies. Uh, Professor Norwood has also been the winner of the Herbert Gutman Award in American Social History, and a co-winner of the Saber? Saber. Saber. The Saber Macmillan Award in Baseball History. Um, just a few words about his topic, um, <laughs> not baseball, but the very serious matter of the way in which the Ivy League universities in the United States in particular and the presidents of those institutions and professors and students and editors of campus uh, publications, the way in which they responded to the rise of Nazi Germany. I don't think anybody previously had provided such a methodical, thoroughly researched and pretty damning indictment, but not one which I think is overtly polemical, it simply establishes the case in a very convincing way of how the leading institutions like Harvard, like Yale, like Princeton, like Columbia University, um, which does not come out in shining colors on the side of the angels, how these institutions were complicit at a time when the record already at the beginning of the Nazi regime was fairly clear and well reported in the American press. And the Seven Sisters, uh, elite colleges for women like Smith, Wellesley, Mount Holyoke, Radcliffe and so on, uh, come out uh, particularly badly from this account as do departments of German which uh, emerge across the United States as being veritable nests of um, pro-Nazi sympathy. And I must say I had a particular interest because of my own uh, research in this field 
to see the response of Catholic um, universities and institutions who seem to have been pretty much across the board pro-Hitler, pro-Mussolini, pro-Franco. So one sees that the United States, the beacon of freedom, the bastion of democracy, and all the other epithets that we are familiar with, that when it comes to its academic elites, and this will surely ring a bell for us today, given the situation on American campuses, which will be addressed uh, later, um, to see the scale of this complicity, both in sympathy for Nazi Germany and the ed higher education institutions in the Third Reich, but also the complicity in anti-Semitism. Uh, probably most of you know, and it's part of the prelude to the story, and I'm sure it will come out um, from Professor Norwood's lecture, but Harvard, or as early as 1922, the president of Harvard, Lowell, uh, instituted, advocated, and then instituted a numerous clauses, um, a formal quota on the number of Jews who could be admitted to Harvard. And then in explaining or justifying its position, suggesting that it was the strong race feeling among Jews that was the cause of anti-Semitism. And this was part of the uh, atmosphere in American uh, universities, even if it wasn't universal, and the book also brings out the fact that there were others who opposed and protested, but were also harshly treated by those same institutions for their protest against this kind of complicity uh, with Nazism. So we have names like James Bryant Conant, president of Harvard through most of the 1930s, um, and also institutions uh, like Columbia, uh, University of Chicago, and we could go down a long <coughs> list. And I think that for those of us today who want to understand the background in depth of the problem on American campuses, it's timely and important to have a study of this depth which shows us that uh, when it comes to um, intellectuals, and academics and higher education, we should take, literally take nothing for granted. So at this point, I'm happy to hand over to Professor Norwood. Thank you very much. Well, uh, during the 1930s, <clears throat> uh, America's leading colleges and universities forged friendly ties <clears throat> with thoroughly Nazified universities in Germany. And by doing so, they helped enhance the Hitler regime's prestige in the West. <clears throat> Many American universities warmly welcomed top Nazi officials to campus, where they enthusiastically praised the Third Reich. <clears throat> Administrators refused to criticize them, despite calls from the Jewish community and some students to do so. Prominent American academics were flattered to have the Nazi government bestow honorary degrees on them. The nation's leading universities eagerly participated in well-orchestrated Nazi propaganda festivals organized by the Hitler regime at German universities. And until World War II began, American colleges and universities enthusiastically participated in student exchange programs with Germany's Nazified universities, which had expelled their Jewish faculty members. From the beginning of Nazi rule, in January 1933, many American and British journalists reported that the Hitler regime was far more oppressive than anything the world had ever seen. Uh, the American Jewish press immediately labeled Hitler the new Haman, and uh, as everyone knew, uh, Haman had tried to destroy the Jewish people. Only a few weeks after the Nazis came to power, the New York Times reported that American travelers returning from Germany were emphasizing that, quote, to be either of Jewish faith or origin in Germany now constituted a crime. Britain's Manchester Guardian stated in April 1933 that, quote, in city after city and village after village, there is such an abundance of barbarism that modern analogies fail. In the same month, a New York Times correspondent wrote from Germany that the Jews there were like toads under the harrow. Journalists reported that the Nazis delighted in publicly humiliating Jews, parading them through towns in refuse carts, 
and imprisoning them in pigsties. And there were articles about this from the very beginning, about episodes like that in the American press. On April 1st, 1933, the Nazis signaled their intention of economically strangling the Jewish population by staging a one-day boycott of Jewish stores. Many saw that as the first step toward extermination. Particularly frightening was the yellow circle that the stormtroopers affixed over the entrance to Jewish stores, the medieval badge of shame for Jews, demonstrating a reversion to the vicious anti-Semitism of that era. The boycott was almost immediately followed by the expulsion of Jews from the professions and from university faculties. And in May 1933, Germany's National Student Organization conducted massive book burnings uh, of what it called un-German books at universities across the Reich. The Nazis cast into the flames many of the world's greatest works of scholarship and literature. The book burnings and the expulsion of Jewish faculty dramatically underlined the termination of genuine higher education in Germany. And in the West, some of those reading of the German bonfires undoubtedly recalled Heinrich Heine's prescient warning more than a century before, where books are burned, in the end, people will be burned too. Many Western observers noted the sharp deterioration in academic standards in Germany's universities under the Nazis. And the United States ambassador to Germany, William E. Dodd, was so sickened by the damage that Nazis had inflicted on higher education in Germany that he dreaded even passing through a German university town. And he refused to accept any honorary degree from a German university. The Nazis' terrorist campaign against the Jews and assault on academic freedom were widely reported in the American press from the beginning. And yet, America's university elite, capable of influencing public opinion against Nazi barbarism, chose not to do so. Instead, the nation's educational leaders engaged in numerous actions that enhanced Nazi prestige in the West as Germany intensified its persecution of Jews and strengthened its armed forces. This reprehensible behavior was shaped by the anti-Semitism that pervaded America's university elite throughout the 1930s. America's universities restricted Jewish enrollment all the way through the Holocaust. University presidents often made blatantly anti-Semitic remarks in their correspondence. For example, when the DuPont Corporation sought the advice of Harvard's president, James Conant, a prominent chemist, about hiring German refugee chemist uh, Max Bergman, Conant recommended against hiring him, emphasizing that he was, quote, very definitely the Jewish type. When Bergman died 10 years later, the New York Times identified him as one of the world's leading organic chemists. While America's university leaders largely failed to react in any significant way to the onset of Nazi barbarism, American Jews at the grassroots, joined by some concerned non-Jews, mobilized in massive street demonstrations to protest Nazi anti-Semitism. University administrators failed to participate in the two massive waves of anti-Nazi street demonstrations and rallies in major U.S. cities in March and May of 1933, or even promote them on campus. Typical of the massive mobilization of ordinary citizens at the grassroots against Nazism was the May 10, 1933 march of 100,000 people in New York City. The marchers included uniformed World War veterans, members of Zionist organizations, a labor contingent numbering in the thousands, scores of rabbis in long black robes, bearded Jews from the Lower East Side, and representatives of the literary, artistic, and theatrical worlds. Many carried placards that read, Hitler, this is not the period of the Dark Ages. The Undertaker's Union marched with a sign, which is my favorite sign from these demonstrations, that read, we want Hitler. <laughs> During 1933, Jewish organizations initiated a boycott of German goods and services. They were joined uh, in the fall by the American Federation of Labor. And this generated massive support at the grassroots, particularly among Jews and union members. But American university leaders did not join in. Indeed, they, they violated the boycott repeatedly. Uh, prominent university presidents like Nicholas Murray Butler of Columbia and Robert Maynard Hutchins uh, of uh, the University of Chicago uh, uh, several times sailed across the Atlantic in German uh, liners flying the swastika flag. And in fact, Hutchins was bewildered uh, as to why he was being criticized for that. 
In December 1933, President Butler of Columbia, who was the most well-known of America's university presidents, warmly welcomed to the Columbia campus Nazi Germany's ambassador to the United States, Dr. Hans Luther. President Butler dismissed criticism of the invitation and praised the Nazi ambassador as, quote, a gentleman, honest, and well-mannered. As, quote, the diplomatic representative of a friendly people, uh, he, uh, Butler said Luther was entitled to, quote, the greatest courtesy and respect. Butler was not concerned that the Nazis had recently burned the book of one of Columbia's own professors, Franz Boas, the world's leading anthropologist of the time. The day of Luther's speech, Columbia's student newspaper, The Spectator, published an editorial entitled, Silence Gives Consent, Dr. Butler, that bitterly denounced the Columbia president's failure to criticize the Nazis. The uh, Nazis' uh, destruction of democracy, their persecution of Jews, book burning, uh, all of these, the Spectator declared, uh, uh, had been ignored by President Butler. They said, this is the government which President Butler, by his silence, has given the impression that he condones. Believing that Jerome Klein, a popular and talented fine arts instructor, had been the leader in circulating a petition denouncing the administration's bringing Luther to campus, President Butler terminated his appointment and permanently destroyed a very promising uh, academic career. And I'll point out that to this day, President Bollinger of Columbia has shown no interest in this case, and, and the Colum current Columbia administration um, will not take any steps to, uh, uh, to do justice for uh, uh, Jerome Klein. Uh, a year uh, after Luther's visit, a Columbia student group invited anti-Nazi refugee Gerhard Zeger, a former Social Democratic Reichstag deputy, to speak on campus. The student group asked President Butler to join Zeger on, on the podium and present his views on Nazism. Zeger had made a daring escape from the Orionienburg concentration camp in December 1933, and with stormtroopers on his heels, had slipped into Czech Czechoslovakia. Uh, and then had made his way to the United States, where he provided Americans with one of the very first eyewitness, direct eyewitness accounts of what Germany was like under Nazi rule. Although President Butler could have used this opportunity to publicly proclaim opposition to Nazism and show his support for a courageous adversary of Hitler, he declined to appear at the presentation, which was chaired by Professor Reinhold Niebuhr. An audience of 300 heard Zager declare that, quote, sadism and cruelty beyond anyone's expectation prevailed in Germany's concentration camps. Zager repeatedly urged Americans to boycott German goods and services and, and, and never to travel to Germany. At Harvard, President James, James Conant's administration provided a very friendly reception for one of the top Nazi party officials, Ernst Homstangel, who was Adolf Hitler's foreign press chief. Uh, Hamstangel was a Harvard graduate from the class of 1909 and was going to attend his 25th reunion. He was one of Hitler's earliest backers. It had been at Hamstangel's villa that Hitler had taken refuge after the Munich Beer Hall Putsch. Uh, Hamstangel claimed to have uh, introduced the Nazis' stiff-armed uh, salute and Sieg Heil chant, uh, modeling them uh, on a Harvard uh, football cheer that he had led as a cheerleader in his student days. A fanatical anti-Semite, Homstangle had in April 1933 told American diplomat James McDonald that, quote, the Jews must be crushed. They were, quote, the vampire sucking German blood. McDonald wrote in his diary that Homstangle then, quote, launched into a terrifying account of Nazi plans. The April 1st boycott was to be only a beginning. Noting that Germany had taken one and a half million prisoners in the World War, Homstangle declared that 600,000 Jews would be easy. The Nazis would assign a stormtrooper to each Jew and, quote, in a single night, it could be finished. McDonald was not certain we uh, whether this meant that the Nazi plan was to imprison the entire German Jewish population or to exterminate them. Now, this is in April 1933. Shortly before Homstangel arrived for the reunion, the Harvard student newspaper, The Crimson, urged the administration to award Homstangel an honorary degree. A, quote, mark of honor, the Crimson declared, appropriate to his high position in the government of a friendly country, unquote. Boston's newspapers repeatedly emphasized how fond his Harvard classmates were of Homstangel. Fraternizing with the Nazi leader at the reunion were many of the nation's leading financiers, industrialists, educators, corporate attorneys, and scientists. 
At the class of 1909 party at the Harvard Union, Homstangle recalled for his classmates the many long nights that he and Hitler had spent at his villa talking of the day and excitedly exclaimed to his rapt Harvard listeners, now the day is here. Reporters noted that all through the dinner, Homstangel was besieged by autograph seekers. As the Nazi leader partied with his classmates, Harvard police ripped down uh, anti-Nazi stickers that protesters had posted in the yard, suggesting the Harvard award Homstangel uh, a degree of doctor of pogroms. The joyous festivities were briefly interrupted when Rabbi Joseph Schubau confronted Homstangel as he spoke with reporters in Harvard Yard. Rabbi Schubau demanded to know the meaning of a, a remark that Homstangel had made a few days before to the press that everything would soon be settled for the Jews in Germany. Trembling violently, Rabbi Schubau cried out, my people want to know, does it mean extermination? Harvard police immediately ushered the Nazi official away to President Conan's house for tea. During the commencement, a mass demonstration was staged against Hofstangel in uh, Harvard Square. Police arrested seven demonstrators, uh, charging them with speaking without a permit, and they were sentenced to six months in prison at hard labor. Uh, President Conant did not intervene. Uh, he denounced their, in, in private correspondence, uh, he refers to their protest as ridiculous. Upon Homstangel's triumphant return to Germany, Hitler bestowed upon him the honor of opening up the Nuremberg Congress. In September 1934, that, that very month, Roscoe Pound, the dean of Harvard Law School, personally accepted an honorary degree from the University of Berlin, presented uh, personally by Nazi Ambassador Hans Luther at the Harvard Law School. Uh, of course, the University of Berlin had been the site of a major book burning. When Felix Frankfurter, then a Harvard law professor and later United States Supreme Court Justice, learned that uh, Ambassador Luther was going to do this uh, at the law school, he protested to President Conant that Harvard was tying a tail to the Nazi kite, that is, lending its prestige to the Hitler regime. Frankfurter did not want the ceremony held at Harvard and did not want President Conant to attend it. Conant replied to Frankfurter that he would attend. He did not want to insult what he called a friendly government. Frankfurter was deeply disgusted, noting that President Conan had allowed the law school building to be turned into what he called a Nazi holiday. When Dean Pound had the audacity to invite Frankfurter to the ceremony, Frankfurter replied, quote, I cannot attend any function in honor of a representative of a government which Mr. Justice Holmes has accurately characterized as a challenge to civilization. He declared that he could, quote, not suppress my sense of humiliation that my beloved law school, the center of Anglo-American law, should confer a special distinction upon an official representative of enthroned lawlessness. And in May 1935, the Harvard administration allowed the Nazi consul general to place a wreath with a swastika on it in the Harvard chapel to, to honor Harvard men uh, killed fighting for Germany during the World War. The, the press interpreted that at the time as, along with the Homstangel reception, as a, a, a recognition by Harvard of the Hitler regime. Determined to forge strong ties with the Third Reich's universities, despite their Nazification, over 20 American colleges and universities, including Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Cornell, Vassar, quite a number of others, sent delegates to Nazi Germany in 1936 to celebrate the University of Heidelberg's 550th anniversary. No British university would send a delegate. This was a well-orchestrated Nazi propaganda festival conducted by Joseph Goebbels and his propaganda ministry. They knew exactly what they were doing here. They were trying to build up uh, Nazi prestige in the West by making Nazi Germany look like it was a respected member of the community of nations and to draw Western academics to the Heidelberg campus. The festival, and, and you could not miss the significance of this, was scheduled to culminate. Um, the climactic day was going to be June 30th, 1936, which was the, the, the anniversary of the Night of the Long Knives, very important on the Nazi calendar. Many Jews and concerned non-Jews, along with the Columbia Spectator, warned America's universities that the Nazis would claim that the presence of their delegates 
at the festival demonstrated American academia's support for the Hitler regime. From the very beginning, the administrators are getting letters uh, from uh, quite a number of uh, people uh, not to do this. This is the, you're playing right into the Nazis' hands. The Columbia Spectator's editor-in-chief declared, quote, the idea of a representative of Columbia University seating himself on the same platform with a monstrous Joseph Goebbels, who would officially greet the delegates, is utterly obscene. And at Columbia, 1,000 students and faculty members signed the petition protesting the administration sending a delegate to Heidelberg. People like Franz Boas signed, Nobel laureate Harold Urey, very, very prominent uh, distinguished members uh, of, of the faculty signed this, along with many, many students. But the protests were to no avail. The presidents of Harvard, Yale, and Columbia actually got together and corresponded for some time about how to deflect criticism of their decision each to send a delegate to Heidelberg. President Conant declared that, quote, the ancient ties by which the universities of the world are united are independent of political considerations. Alvin Johnson, director of the New School for Social Research, which alone among American universities hired a significant number of refugee faculty, branded Harvard's idea of an international community of scholars that included Nazi Germany to be a dangerous delusion. He emphasized that there no longer existed any free German university. Uh, this point was lost on America's uh, higher education leaders. They, they, they kept uh, insisting uh, that these universities were legitimate academic places. An angry President Butler of Columbia reacted very harshly to the student protests. He expelled from the university Robert Burke, leader of a group of students which had staged a mock book burning to protest the sending of a delegate to the Nazi propaganda festival at Heidelberg. After the mock book burning, Bur Burke had then led the students to President Butler's mansion where they had established a peaceful picket line, protesting Columbia's involvement with this festival. The next day, the dean of Columbia College called Burke into his office and told him that his leading the demonstration was disgraceful. Many years later, a friend of Burke stated in describing this event, anyone knowing Bob could predict his answer to the dean. Disgraceful to holler about holding hands with the Nazis. If there's another demonstration tomorrow, I'll speak there too. President Butler was uncomfortable with Robert Burke, a passionate anti-fascist who was working his way through Columbia and permanently destroyed his academic career. He was expelled from the university, uh, never allowed to re-enroll. To this day, again, President Bollinger, the current Columbia administration, uh, despite um, requests for them to uh, grant Burke his degree and to admit wrongdoing, uh, refuses to do so. Butler considered uh, Nazi Ambassador Luther a gentleman and was pleased to welcome him to campus to deliver a Nazi propaganda speech, but had no use for Robert Burke, the anti-Nazi, uh, a very, very uh, committed and passionate person who, who had uh, worked for several years in a steel mill and as a truck driver to earn his Columbia tuition. Robert Burke and Jerome Klein are truly real heroes of the 1930s and should be recognized as such. It should always be remembered that the German universities propagated Nazi racial ideology and assisted the Hitler regime in developing its anti-Semitic legislation. And I have to talk about the Nazi biologists, the anthropologists, and their involvement in elaborating their racist anti-Semitic doctrines. Uh, the law professors who helped draw up the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, these people were ensconced in universities. The medical faculty that uh, uh, sterilized the unfit, so-called. Uh, uh, the the uh, I should also uh, mention that Heidelberg University was a center for what the Nazis called Aryan physics. Uh, this is the type of subject that they were teaching. 
and is a, a good example of the Nazis' contempt for academic standards. We should never forget what historian Max Weinreich noted in 1946, quote, German scholars from the beginning to the end of the Hitler era worked hand in glove with the murderers of the Jewish people. Harvard University invited representatives of Germany's Nazified universities to participate in its tercentenary celebration held in September 1936. It announced it would award honorary degrees to 10 academics from the Third Reich. These included Werner Heisenberg, who during World War II directed Nazi Germany's effort to develop an atomic bomb. Harvard scheduled the tercentenary exercises for Rosh Hashanah, ignoring protests from the Jewish community. I mean, the, the, like from over a year before that these protests were being uh, directed at the administration, they wouldn't listen to them. Even the Cambridge City Council passed a resolution asking Harvard not to do this, not to schedule it on that day. They didn't listen. When Dr. Charles Singer of the University of London wrote to President Conant to express strong opposition to Harvard sending a delegate to Heidelberg, Conant replied that the logic of Singer's position would require Harvard to ban from its tercentenary events, quote, German scientists who have embraced Nazi policy but nevertheless remain distinguished members of the world of scholars, unquote. Conant pronounced Singer's view absurd. Indeed, from the time Hitler assumed power in 1933 until the outbreak of World War II, American universities enthusiastically participated in academic and cultural exchanges with the Third Reich. The Seven Sisters Women's Colleges spearheaded these exchanges, the most elite of the nation's women's colleges. This was partly because their administrations believed that European study would impart a cultural polish to their students. Uh, it was also because the Seven Sisters were, were particularly focused on uh, teaching the foreign languages. The Seven Sisters were central to the junior year abroad program that was uh, maintained at the University of Munich from 1931 uh, until the outbreak of World War II. Many of the Seven Sisters students also studied in summer programs at uh, universities of Berlin and Heidelberg and other German universities. Uh, the Seven Sisters organized tours in 1934 uh, at a special celebration Hitler's uh, government had set up for the uh, Oberammergau uh, Passion Play, the virulently anti-Semitic uh, play um, that uh, had been um, for centuries performed uh, in Bavaria. Uh, Hitler was a big fan of this uh, uh, virulently anti-Semitic play, he personally met with the cast on stage and strongly endorsed the play, proclaiming that uh, never has the menace of Jewry been so convincingly portrayed. The Seven Sisters' determination to forge friendly ties with Nazified universities in Germany is striking because the Hitler regime severely curtailed women's access to a university education and to labor force opportunities generally, uh, imposing a strict 10% uh, quota on mission of women students and defining women's central role as that of mother and homemaker and promoting the five-child family as the norm. Uh, and there, there were people in the United States like the exiled Social Democratic Reichstag uh, deputy uh, Tony Sender, who along with Zager was in 1934 lecturing around this country uh, about what Nazi Germany looked like from the inside. She also had narrowly escaped being murdered by the Nazis and she also had escaped donning a disguise and uh, fleeing into the woods of Czechoslovakia, making her way to this country. Um, and uh, she denounced uh, uh, Nazi uh, women's policy very directly. Um, Dorothy Thompson, the uh, 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 very experienced uh, journalist, uh, knowledgeable about European affairs, uh, also condemned Nazi women's policy um, in uh, lectures in this country. So it was known what was going on, but the Seven Sisters nonetheless wanted to maintain very friendly relations with the Nazified universities. Uh, and their students, uh, when they were sent over there, generally became greatly enamored of the Third Reich and became propagandists for it. A Mount Holyoke student writing from Munich in 1938 declared that, quote, any account by any junior here is bound to turn into a testimonial. Four Vassar students published a lengthy feature in the Vassar Review explaining how living in the Third Reich had led them to dismiss American press reports 
of militarism, terrorism, and bloodshed in Germany, and to truly appreciate what the Germans had accomplished under Hitler's rule. One of them, speaking at Vassar in a campus forum upon her return from Germany, praised the Nazis for restoring what she called religious unity to Germany. She concluded her presentation by declaring, Hitler is not militaristic. He has sincerely spoken for peace. Another Vassar senior, having spent her junior year at the University of Munich, declared her admiration for Nazi students and their determination to, quote, clean up Germany. The book burnings they had carried out across the Reich in May 1933 impressed her as, quote, a solemn, symbolic ceremony. The Seven Sisters Colleges welcomed the opportunity to enroll Germany's exchange students, whom Hitler sent to the United States as political soldiers of the Reich. These were carefully screened by the Nazi government. Uh, to ensure that they were committed Nazis. They wrote articles in uh, American college newspapers praising Hitler and his regime. They spoke at campus forums. You will never see an American university administrator responding to these articles uh, or comments. Barnard College's German exchange student for the academic year 1937-38 told the Barnard Bulletin that, quote, Jewish blood was different from that of Germans. And as a result, Jews could only be guests in Germany. She said that anti-Jewish discrimination was justified because Jews had acquired too much control over money. Matt Holyoke's International Relations Club hosted a lecture by another German exchange student who denounced what she called the, quote, propaganda spread about Jewish persecutions in the Third Reich. The Seven Sisters sponsored social events to promote friendship between the United States and Nazi Germany. I and mean, there are many T's where the presidents and other high administrators uh, meet with the, the Nazi consul general uh, and you know, eat cookies with him and sip tea um, and have a, a, a very pleasant time together. Uh, Wellesley College had arranged a dance and reception for German naval cadets from the Nazi battle cruiser Karlsruhe when it sailed into Boston Harbor on a Nazi goodwill tour in May 1934, flying the swastika flag. This visit was immediately condemned by the Jewish community and, uh, and uh, uh, Rab Boston Rabbi Samuel Abrams denounced the, the Karl's rule as an instrument of hate and darkness. By contrast, um, Wellesley invites the cadets to campus for a dance. The Wellesley College News portrayed the cadets as very appealing young blonde men, immaculate in their uniforms, friendly, so often sincere. Soon after the cadets' arrival, the floor was filled with dancing couples. Everybody enjoyed the punch and cookies. Only after the Kristallnacht pogroms, the Kristallnacht pogroms of November 1938, did several elite university presidents speak out against Nazi persecution of the Jews. And th this is one thing you'll get in response. Uh, when when the, uh, I make these charges, you might hear uh, some feeble attempt to say, well, uh, uh, some of these guys spoke out about the Kristallnacht. The response is tepid compared to what you see coming from the grassroots. The presidents of the universities restricted themselves to condemning what they term German horrors. I mean, there's no really specific mention of Jews or anti-Semitism, for one thing. The, the, these these are, are just oral statements that are made. Uh, I will uh, give you, in contrast, the 30,000 merchants, small merchants mostly, in New York City. I mean, people had to, to keep their stores open, you know, like 14, 16 hours or so to eke out a living. They shut down in a coordinated protest after the crystal knock. There are small grocery stores, butcher shops, bakeries, drug stores and other retail establishments, coordinating a one-hour protest across New York City against Nazi anti-Semitic persecutions in Germany. What protests developed on the campuses was student-initiated, not administrator-initiated, and largely confined to raising funds to pay expenses to enroll a small number of refugee students. When administrations agreed to student proposals to raise money for German uh, refugee students, they would only waive tuition. The students then had to raise all the other money for lodging, for uh, travel, for food, and uh, uh, books and all, this, uh, all the other expenses. Uh, the administrations also uh, insisted, required, that a significant proportion of the refugee students not be Jewish. 
This was in part because of strong alumni pressure, warning the administrators they didn't want this money going for, for Jews. So the administrators uh, uh, put a, a quota on the number of Jew Jews who could get these refugee scholarships. University leaders did not join the many in the Jewish community and the labor movement who demanded relaxation of immigration quotas, tightening the boycott of German goods, and breaking off diplomatic relations with Germany. Peter Gay, in, his, in an autobiography, mentioned, who was in uh, Berlin during the Kristallnacht, that, that uh, basically, in the end, the uh, protests coming from the West after the Kristallnacht uh, it sounded nice, but were, were essentially hollow. And what was needed uh, for the Jews of Germany, who, who were still surviving at that point, was a place to go. And, and uh, there, was, there was certainly no pressure from the higher education community to, to uh, relax Im immigration restrictions. Okay, that's what was needed. Not so, you know a few statements about um, you know th this this is wrong uh, 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 what was done, but some practical action. That's what people were calling for at the grassroots quite often. President Conan of Harvard declared, quote, it would be very unfortunate for college presidents either individually or collectively to attempt to exert any pressure on the State Department or the Labor Department to lower immigration barriers. So to conclude, uh, let me uh, first quote from uh, a report by uh, New York Times uh, correspondent Frederick Burchild. Uh, writing right after the wave of violent attacks against Jews in the streets of Berlin in July 1935, Birchall noted that, quote, anti-Semitism in its worst form is in the saddle in Germany, and that, quote, there is nothing save some echo of world opinion to exercise the least check upon it, unquote. Edward R. Murrow, later to become the great CBS broadcaster, accurately describe the reaction of America's educational elite at this critical time. Quote, the thing that really concerns me, he said in 1935, is the general indifference of the university world and the smug complacency in the face of what has happened to Germany. It is truly shameful that America's colleges and universities, uh, uh, the, the people who are leading uh, these institutions, and are in a position to influence public opinion, remained indifferent to Germany's terrorist campaign against the Jews, and instead, on numerous occasions, assisted the Nazis in their efforts to gain acceptance in the West. Well, I think you all agree with me that that was a uh, pretty damning indictment of something which is, uh, needs to be known much better than it really is. And uh, Stephen Norwood has really shown us the way to understanding the background for so much of the tepid policy of appeasement and the disastrous consequences and its link with anti-Semitism. And it uh, reminds me of uh, a review you showed me of your book that appeared in Germany um, in the Süddeutsche Zeitung from Munich. I believe uh, the headline there was Unser Freunde die Nazis, Our Friends the Nazis, which really seems to sum up the position of the university administrations in the Ivy League uh, institutions of the United States. Our second speaker um, this evening is Eunice Pollack, who also received her PhD in history from Columbia uh, in 1999. It appears that Columbia uh, has indeed uh, played a significant role uh, in more senses than one. And since uh, 2001, She's a professor of uh, history and Jewish studies at the University of North Texas. And her fields include anti-Semitism from ancient times to the present, American Jewish history, Jews and gender, history of the family, history of youth, history of the emotions. 
And as I said before, she's co-editor with uh, Professor Norwood of the Encyclopedia of American Jewish History. And also the editor of a new interdi interdisciplinary book series, Anti-Semitism in American History. The first volume in this series, which is edited and which is scheduled to come out in the fall of this year, and which I'm very much looking forward to, and is obviously relevant to this evening's discussion, is called Anti-Semitism on the Campus, Past and Present. Uh, most uh, recent uh, publication, uh, an article, I believe, um, entitled The Childhood We Have Lost When Siblings Were Caregivers 1900 to 1970. Today, she's going to speak about a subject which um, brings us more up to the present and it, it relates to anti Zionism, anti-Semitism, and black nationalism in the United States. Um, if I may, or just very briefly, take one little anecdote which may or may not connect up to, um, to your presentation. Uh, when I arrived in the United States as an MA student, it was in 1967, and in fact it was just after the Six Day War. And I was at Stanford University, and a friend of mine uh, told me to come with him to Berkeley to listen to a young uh, agitator whose name at that time was still Stokely Carmichael. And I went to this mass meeting held by um, the, I think it was called the Student Non-Coordinating Committee, and Carmichael was the speaker. And it was the first time in my life that I had heard such a, an electrifying but also absolutely spine-chilling demagogic uh, performance which literally had a crowd that was mixed with black and white, uh, mainly white radical students. And the one phrase that stuck in my mind from his presentation was the concept which he may not have coined, but he used, of kosher fascism. This was his description of Israel already then. Uh, I think it was June or July, 1967, uh, July probably. And um, the speech was full of echoes of a kind of uh, black power, anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, all blended together. And uh, that was... That was something I'll never forget. So I'm looking forward to your presentation. Okay, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, uh, the title of the talk is going to be Smoke and Mirrors on the American Campus. And I think you'll see what I mean. Uh, Anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and black nationalism. And uh, the significance of this, the enormous impact of the black nationalists uh, will become clear as I go on and I will uh, sum up towards the end. But from the mid-1960s, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism increasingly became part of the fabric of American campus life and conflicts. For three decades, it was African-American student organizations that shaped the anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist discourse before Arab and Muslim American groups on campus uh, assumed the lead near the turn of the 21st century. By characterizing anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist claims simply as protected campus speech or even essential parts of students' re-education, a number of black student organizations, BSOs, often sympathetic to the black nationalist views and black studies programs foreshadowed and in effect prepared the way for the Muslim student unions and Middle East studies departments academic uh, assaults on Israel and Jews. Many of the patterns that characterized campus conflicts of the early 21st century had been forged and hardened in the earlier period when speakers invited by BSOs 
leveled, is it all right? When speakers invited by BSOs leveled their patently false charges, followed by preemptive denials that the, that the claims could be anti-Semitic, when administrators often equivocated, minimized the menace, or offered courses in role-playing or tolerance, and faculty pandered to the students and only rarely provided accurate data, context, or informed argument to counter the allegations and invective. Indeed, Muslim student unions and Palestinian student organizations drew expressly on the experiences of the BSOs as they sought to lure students to their cause. Earlier, students had rushed to defend the BSO speakers in an effort to prove that they were not racists. Similarly, the new leaders sought to convince other students that they could now show their, show that they were not racists only by allying with them. Thus, they characterized Israel as an apartheid state, where Jews ghettoized people of color and discriminated against them. Pro-Israel Jews, they taught, quote, were only celebrating the triumph of racism and ethnic cleansing in Palestine. So I want you to, what I'm trying to communicate, and I think that you'll see, is that this earlier movement, uh, shaped by the black nationalists and the black student organizations in the last three and a half decades of the 20th century became the template, or at least served as the template, on which uh, this new anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism was, if you will, you know, hammered out. Many of the speakers whom black student groups featured again and again attracted overflow audiences and developed large adulatory, you know, adulation, adulatory followings on campus were black nationalists whose rants offered up a combination of classical anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. Although there are those who maintain that anti-Zionism need not be anti-Semitic in the preachings of representatives of black nationalist groups, often anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism were seamlessly merged. The virulent anti-Zionism of the Nation of Islam, that's NOI, the virulent anti-Zionism of the Nation of Islam, for example, had deep roots in its extremely negative ideology about Jews. It is not surprising that it was Malcolm X, a leading figure of the NOI for 17 years, he joined in 47, he left in March of 64, and he was assassinated February 21st, uh, February 21st 1965. So he was not a member only for 11 months. Uh, Malcolm X is on a postage stamp today, and I think that we should uh, consider what that means. It is not surprising that it was Malcolm X, a leading figure of the NOI for 17 years, and who counted himself a strong anti-Zionist, whom Louis Farrakhan, head of the NOI since 1977 through today, uh, credited with promoting the protocols of the learned elders of Zion and putting it on, quote, Black's essential reading list. Uh, indeed, Farrakhan explained that it was the protocol's revelations of Jews' conspiracy to take over the world that led, quote, Brother Malcolm to understand this is what shapes Malcolm's understanding of oppression in America and here. Uh, that led a Brother Malcolm to understand and expose the real motives that underlay Jews' involvement in, quote, the NAACP and the civil rights movement, as well as Israel's goals in the Middle East. The NOI and several other militant groups that promoted black nationalism and black power in these years sought both to delegitimize Jews as a progressive group and Israel as a Jewish state. Although in these decades, the NOI and others who shared its perspective now obsessively focused their rage on Israel and on Jews, earlier the central villains of the NOI narrative were whites, both Christians and Jews. Even in the 1990s, the NOI's most popular provocateur on campus 
routinely began his harangues by declaiming that he was not going to play, quote, pin the tail on the donkey, but, quote, pin the tail on the honky, uh, a pejorative term for whites. He invariably pro proceeded, however, to pin the tail and horns on the Jew, literally demonizing the Jewish state and Jews. If earlier it was whites who had erected an apartheid state, now it was Zionist Jews who built an apartheid wall. Farrakhan often claimed that it was the American, quote, white man who, quote, made a nigger. You educated niggers to be niggers, he claimed but he now attributed the responsibility for the degraded condition of blacks solely to Jews. Quote, you'll never succeed, Farrakhan warned his black audiences, not because of whites, but quote, because of Jews. They're plotting against us even as we speak, unquote. Repeatedly stressed by the nationalists, it was a lesson absorbed by the many black youth influenced by them. As one 18-year-old stated categorically, quote, behind every hurdle that the African-American has yet to dump, jump stands the Jew, barring the way. Formerly, the NOI emphasized that it was the insidious whites who used, quote, tricknology to dominate blacks. But now it was the Jews, the Zionists, who were deceiving them. I'm going to try to skip over some of my examples, maybe we can talk about them as we go on, but for the sake of uh, cons conservation of time. Formerly it was whites who were condemned for slavery and the slave trade, but in 1991 the NOI changed the players, reassigning the quote dominant role to Jews. Jews were now responsible for the expulsion of blacks from their African homeland and Zionist Jews for driving Palestinian Arabs from their homes. Although the NOI had long held not only whites, but Christianity, responsible for the subjugation of black people, increasingly its spokespeople would refocus attention on the culpability of Judaism and Jews. W.D. Fard, the founder of the Nation of Islam, had identified Christianity as a, quote, dirty religion. But a half century later, it was Judaism to which Farrakhan attached the founder's exact words. The NOI characterized the Christian Bible as, quote, the poison book, and Christianity as an unholy conspiracy designed to obscure the fact that Jesus was black and had been sent by Allah to teach the truths of Islam. Worse, Christianity maintained that its followers were capable of goodness, which was inconceivable because whites had been artificially formed by the evil, big-headed scientist Yacoub as a devil race. These teachings were central to the NOI's foundation narrative and could never be disavowed. But its spokesman now drew attention to the pernicious Hebrew Bible and the Babylonian Talmud which, they alleged, invented black racism, the punishment of the descendants of Ham. Uh, no matter that blacks were the descendants of Cush, not Ham, and that this was the interpretation of Muslims, not Jews. The NOI had revealed the Christian's true nature and now was determined to expose the satanic Jew and Jewish state, both craftily obscured behind a progressive disguise. Even as, Christian, is this my, this one second. Even as Christianity began its retreat, began its retreat from two millennia of Judeophobia, of linking Jews and Satan, the nation of Islam and some other black nationalists clung to the old image and language while providing their own spin. The NOI persisted in hurling the old Christian accusations at Jews, shrieking, quote, Jesus was right. You're nothing but liars. The book of Revelation is right. You're from the synagogue of Satan. But the nation did not have to draw on Christian images alone to portray the treacherous Jew. From its beginnings, 
the NOI theology taught that it was Jews who handed Jesus over to bounty hunters, who then skewered him with a knife. The Jews, they taught, hated Jesus because Jesus knew their origins as white devils and knew that before Allah sent Musa, Moses, uh, the Jews had been savages, barely human, at best wearing animal skins and living in cage, caves. But the nation of Islam and its acolytes now extrapolated from there, with Farrakhan storming that the Jews, quote, were the killer of all the prophets. He and others now charged that they had killed all the more recent black liberators as well. Jews and the Jewish state were truly the agents of Satan. Uh, it followed that Jews were responsible for the ignominious state of the black ghettos and Israel for the instability of the world. The shift of the narrative away from the white devils or the Christian conspiracy to the satanic Jews uh, would greatly expand the black nationalists' audience and even their appeal. I should say here that, uh, that it was Farrakhan himself who was uh, closely involved with the assassination of Malcolm X. In other words, here's a black liberator, it's, Fal it's, Malcolm, it's uh, Farrakhan himself who was closely involved, underscores the ease with which he rid himself of guilt by projecting his evil onto the Jews. I mean, the audacity of saying that it's Jews who are responsible for killing the black liberators is just projection. Uh, okay, I want to skip a few paragraphs. It kills me, but uh, many of the nationalists, Pan-Africanists and other black militants who became iconic figures on campus expressed both anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist worldviews, albeit in various uh, combinations. Indeed, often the strands of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism uh, were woven, were wound so tightly together that one could not locate uh, the beginnings, their roots. For the poet and playwright Leroy Jones, who became Amira Baraka, uh, however, the path to anti-Zionism can be traced. Jones's so anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are tightly intertwined, but in Jones's case, I want to show that we can see, uh, you know, which begat which. Uh, Jones's anti-Semitism is well documented, some of which has even been acknowledged by him. There was the call to, quote, rip off Jewish enterprises. There were the people he referred to as Jew slick. And of course, the harrowing poem, quote, I got the extermination blues, Jew boys. So come for the rent, Jew boys. I got something for you. Gonna give it to my brothers so they'll know what your whole story is. Then one day, Jew boys, we will... Uh, enough. Uh, but in 1980, in a cover story in New York's Village Voice, entitled, quote, Conf Confessions of a Former Anti-Semite, Baraka apologized after fashion, and the key phrase there is after fashion. Uh, Baraka apologized after a fashion and identified anti-Semitism as a, quote, wasteland uh, that he had now left behind. At the end of the long confession, the reader could understand why, as he announced his rebirth as an anti-Zionist. His explanation of his transformation his explanation of his, information, of his transformation left little doubt, however, about the vessel into which he had poured his Jew hatred. Quote, anti-Semitism, unquote, he had discovered, quote, is as ugly an idea and as deadly as white racism and Zionism. No progressive person could ever uphold any of these ideas, unquote. That's from him. Apparently, few people read beyond the title of the article or to the end. And so in 2000, the governor of New Jersey appointed Baraka the state's poet laureate. Indeed, Gerald Stern, the first person who had been awarded the title and who later remarked, I'm sensitive as a Jew, had nominated him. His, quote, confession in the voice had convinced him that Baraka had, quote, repented for his sins. 
Thus, he was stunned by Baraka's new poem. Who knew the World Trade Center was going to get bombed? Who told 4,000 Israeli workers at the Twin Towers to stay home that day? Why did Sharon stay away? Uh, a stunned, stern averred. Israeli is a quote. Israeli is a code word for Jew. And he knows that too. The publisher of the African-American paper, the Amsterdam News, praised the poem as, quote, an epic poem that will live for as long as there is value attached to poetry, unquote. The Newark Star Ledger disagreed. Of poets, one hates to be critical, but not when they're anti-Semitical. The precise, the precise ideology of many others anti-Zionism anti anti was not so clear. But the footprint of anti-Semitism at or near its core was unmistakable. The nationalists and militants sought and found the evil Jew everywhere, quote, pimping the world in an NOI spokesperson's pithy charge robbing people of color of their, quote, birthright, wherever they were. For many, all Jewish wealth was wrung from the blood of us. And what we're going to see is that, uh, as one listener complained, uh, all the trees that the Jews of Los Angeles bought in honor of their grandparents in Israel should really be named for us, because all the money for those trees was wrung from us. Okay, the Black Panthers, who were increasingly celebrated and romanticized on campus, Huey Newton, their, quote, Minister of Defense, even conducted a symposium at Yale with the noted psychologist Eric Erickson. The Black Panthers uh, were virulent anti-Zionists and anti-Semites, both for much the same reason. The Jews only write to the, quote, Zionist fascist state, and that's the affiliations you'll see. The Jews' only right to the, quote, Zionist fascist state was a, quote, robber's right. And uh, from a platform in Jordan in 1970, a Panther delegation called, uh, therefore, for the elimination of the, quote, Zionist entity. The only difference between uh, the Jews of Israel and the, quote, Zionist the Jews of Israel, the Zionist puppet state of imperialism, and the Zionist exploiters and occupiers of the ghetto here in Babylon, here meaning the U.S., here in Babylon, as they termed the U.S., was that the Jews in America, unlike the Jews in Israel, did not serve a higher imperial power. The Jews in America, whom the Panthers always referred to as Zionists, like the arrogant Jews in Israel, always dominated and sacrificed, always that word, always dominated and sacrificed the people of color. A, quote, Zionist judge sentenced Huey Newton, another, quote, Zionist judge sentenced Bobby Seale, sacrificing the only black member of the Chicago 8 conspiracy trial to, quote, four years for contempt of court, while he allowed the other Zionists meaning his seven co-defendants, to go free. Moreover, the other Zionists, quote-unquote, on trial, quote, did sacrifice Bobby Seale. That was the black member, black defendant. Moreover, quote, the other Zionists on trial did sacrifice Bobby Seale for their own pernicious ends to gain publicity. So in America, the Jews sacrificed black leaders, just as in Israel, the Holy Land, uh, they had sacrificed the in original savior and now sacrificed Palestinian Arabs as well. Stokely Carmichael, who would later change his name to Kwame Touré, prime minister of the Black Panther Party, so you see the link, and before that head of SNCC, SNCC, which is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. In 69, they changed their name from nonviolent to national, student national, same black nationalism. A student National Coordinating Committee. So Stokely Carmichael was a pan-Africanist -Africa and a genocidal anti-Zionist who vehemently and disingenuously denied his anti-Semitism. 
quote, I am not now, have never been, nor can ever be, anti-Semitic or anti-Judaic. However, I am and will be unto death anti-Zionist, he wrote in his memoir. Uh, we'll see. At a speech he gave at the University of Maryland in 1986, Touré announced, quote, the only good Zionist is a dead Zionist. Quoting, uh, you know, Phil Sheridan, another would-be uh, genocidal uh, destroyer of the Indians, but nevertheless, it's interesting. Uh, in response to protests organized by Jewish students who demanded that he not be paid his $700 honorarium, the Black Student Union, which had sponsored the talk, refused to apologize, vowing, quote, if we have to pay him out of our pockets, we'll pay him. Earlier in 1970, uh, Touré, so Kwame, uh, Kwame Touré, had famously declared, quote, I have never admired a white man, but the greatest of them, to my mind, was Hitler. That is, the greatest of white men was the one who pursued the genocide of Jews. The question is, whom did Carmichael consider a Zionist? To Carmichael or Touré, Zionists were colonizing or suppressing black people everywhere, east and west. As he had explained in 1967, quote, the same Zionists that exploit the Arabs also exploit, exploit us in this country. To be sure, at that time, 67, you mentioned, uh, the, at that time, the American inner cities were ablaze and the Middle East had just exploded in the Six Day War. But Carmichael never altered his view. Clearly, uh, when he promised, when he pronounced the only good Zionist is a dead Zionist, he wanted a whole lot of Jews dead. The next year, at a national convention of Arab students, Arab students, uh, not yet uh, probably Arab Americans, might be Arab visiting students at this early stage. The next year, at a national convention of Arab students held at the University of Michigan, Carmichael promised that, quote, we will fight to wipe it. Zionism out wherever it exists, be it in the ghetto of the United States or in the Middle East, unquote. Here, he may have been calling for, quote, wiping out Zionism, but significantly, he never suggested how to do it without killing or wiping out Jews. Despite his obsession with evil Jews, with the evil Jews, Carmichael would deny that he was anti-Semitic. He was not even, quote, anti-Judaic, he said. But as many have pointed out, quote, uh, the classical defense of the anti-Semite always was the Jew was singled out not for his Jewishness, but for, quote, objective sins attributed to him. Carmichael attached to Zionism the labels that anti-Semites had, this non-anti-Semite, Carmichael attached to Zionism the labels that anti-Semites had long applied to Judaism and Jews as he denounced quote, Zionist aggression, the, quote, trickery of Zionism, the evil of Zionism. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which he led, also appropriated classical anti-Semitic imagery and deployed it in its cause. Almost any threat to the black man could now be traced to Zionists. When heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali was sentenced for refusing induction into the U.S. Army, it was Moshe Dayan, SNCC pictured, a dollar sign and star of David in his hand, holding the looped rope, that lethal symbol of lynching that was choking Muhammad Ali. But Carmichael's Pan-Africanism added another dimension to the view of the Zionist or Jew. To Carmichael, when the Six-Day War ended with Israel in control of the Sinai, Zionists had seized the black homeland. Zionists owned the ghetto and now had robbed the diaspora blacks of their motherland as well, trying to convince American blacks to share his sense of the expansionist Zionist menace. Carmichael declaimed, quote, we have got to be for the Arabs. We are Africans wherever we are. Israel is moving to take over Egypt. Egypt is our motherland. It's in Africa. Egypt belongs to us since 4,000 years ago, unquote. Like many black nationalists and pan-Africanists, Carmichael conflated 
the Arab lands with all of Africa, some nationalist ideologies positing that they had been black societies since earliest times. In effect, some of the new black nationalists were calling for a crusade that would restore the motherland to them. Some now sought to reverse the Jews' foundation narrative. If Yahweh had once caused the Hebrews' Egyptian oppressors to drown, it was the Egyptians, or for some Allah, who would now obliterate the Zionist entity by driving the Zionists into the sea. To Carmichael, the quote, so-called state of Israel was illegitimate. The Zionists were not the descendants of the original black inhabitants of the land. Notably, it was Carmichael who at Madison Square Garden in 1985 would deliver the opening address for Louis Farrakhan, who presided over what some have likened to a Nuremberg rally, where the audience of African Americanists uh, greeted each anti-Semitic thrust by rising to its feet, cheering, arms outstretched at 45 degrees at degree angles, feet fists clenched. Although ever-increasing numbers of black militants became staunch anti-Zionists in the years framed by the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War, the Nation of Islam had been at least latently anti-Zionist from the time of its founding and the shaping of its ideology by W.D. Fard in the early 1930s. Indeed, Fard's mythology promised to de-victimize blacks by literally demonizing whites and demonizing or erasing Jews. In the Nation of Islam's cosmology, the Jews could only be usurpers in Palestine. The people most others consider Jews are, quote, imposter Jews, who from their origins were only a, quote, European strain of people. The Jews of Palestine, the indigenous Jews, were a black people. NOI members continue to recognize today the, finders te the founders' teachings as gospel. And Farrakhan could dismiss those who labeled him an anti-Semite as, quote, not Semites themselves, but Jews that adopted the faith of Judaism up in Europe. They have nothing to do with the Middle East. They're Europeans, not Semitic people. Their origin is not Palestine, unquote. According to the Nation of Islam's theology, it was only the blacks, what they call the original people, who had settled and created the illustrious civilizations of the Middle East. Thus, in 1956, Elijah Muhammad, who would lead the NOI from the time of Fard's, quote, disappearance in 1933 until his death in 75, was elated when Egypt's president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, stood up to the white imperialist powers, nationalized Suez Canal, placing it for the first time under the co complete jurisdiction of what the NOI considered an African nation and closed it to Israeli shipping. In 1959, when Malcolm X went to Egypt and Me Mecca to prepare for Elijah Muhammad's visit later in the year, he informed his hosts that, quote, the millions of colored people in America would be completely in sympathy with the Arab cause because they are, quote, related to the Arabs by blood. Unquote. According to the NOI belief system, the Arabs and blacks, the founders of North African societies, were one. At their meeting later that year, Elijah Muhammad explained to Nasser that the NOI was the perfect vehicle for, quote, propagating the Arab, Arab cause against Israel in the U.S., unquote. The false Jews had, after all, quote, swindled us. They have stolen our birthright unquote, as a later Minister of Information of the NOI declaimed. And now I want to end by talking Malcolm X, this postage stamp I got. Malcolm X belonged to the Nation of Islam for 17 years, as I said, having li leaving less than a year before his ass assassination and accepted much of its world view. But even after he had left the nation and increasingly became an orthodox Muslim, Classical Christian anti-Semitic images continued to pervade his repeated statements about Jews. Anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism closely intertwined. He portrayed Jews as parasites. 
He portrayed Jews as parasites, preying on the innocent black people from whom they extracted all their wealth. The pound of flesh which they used to build the Jewish state. Again and again, he roused his audiences by telling them of all the Jewish owners of the stores in their neighborhoods who are, quote, robbing you deaf, dumb, and blind. Remember, this is in the last year before he uh, died. Who are, quote, robbing you deaf, dumb, and blind. A vivid image of the parasitical, usurious Jews. Quote, it's Jews right here in Harlem, he went on, quote, that run these whiskey stores that get you drunk. It's Jews that run these rundown stores and sell you bad food, unquote. That is, once again, it is Jews who are poisoning them. A classic anti-Semitic trope. In fact, he informed them, the Jews control about 80% of the economy in most Negro communities across the country. The Jews, in effect, control the black world. Of course, he learns this from the protocols. His audiences could not fail to understand Malcolm's illusions as over and over he spoke of the Jew as bloodsucker, drawing on the most lethal image of Christian anti-Semitism. Jewish bloodlust was causing the murder of innocents once again. He taught that Jews, quote, sap the very lifeblood of the so-called Negroes to maintain the state of Israel, unquote. Quote, Israel, he explained, is just an international poorhouse which is maintained by money sucked from the poor suckers in America, unquote. He pictured the Jewish merchants fleeing after dark every night, quote, with another bag of money drained out of the ghetto, unquote. And then there were the absentee landlords, all apparently Jews. Like Malcolm, drawing heavily on the Christian gospels, Farrakhan ratcheted up the rhetoric and the threat only a notch when, fittingly, on the NOI Savior's Day in 2005, he railed, quote, Jewish people don't have no hands that are free from the blood of us, unquote. The alleged, the original alleged crime had apparently been passed down even uh, unto the current generation of Jews. Once again, drawing on and updating anti-Semitic themes with which his audience had been familiar since childhood, Malcolm X warned them of the cunning, duplicitous Jew. The Jews, he told them, want you to believe they are progressive, but, quote, you can find a whole lot of them who are Nazis, unquote. The Jews only pose as their allies, quote, claim to be friends of the black man, but so many Jews actually were hypocrites, unquote, unquote. His audience could not fail to recognize his barely veiled identification of Jews as Pharisees, which the dictionary still defines as one, quote, pretending to be highly moral or virtuous without actually being so, unquote. He acknowledged that Jews were, quote, among all other whites, the most active in the Negro civil rights movement. But I knew that the Jew played these roles for a very careful, strategic reason. The more prejudice in America could, that could be focused on the Negro, then the more the white Gentiles' prejudice would keep diverted off the Jew, unquote. Of course, in fact, their invo Jews' involvement in the movement intensified antagonism toward the Jew. Uh, he goes on, determined to expose the crafty Jew, claiming, of course, incorrectly, that, quote, so often in the North, the quickest segregationists were Jews themselves. Ultimately, such arguments, this is very important, uh, would lead his successors in the NOI to disclose what those dupl duplicitous Jews had hidden. And so many of their works come out called The Secret Such and Such. They are going to expose what all the other traditional historians historians have hidden from you, the Jewish historians in particular. So ultimately, such arguments would lead his successors in the NOI to disclose the, quote, secret relationship between blacks and Jews, the title of their screed, that Jews dominated the Atlantic slave trade. As leading scholars have shown, of course, Jews had a, quote, very marginal role. If Jews' wealth now came out of the back of every black brother in the ghetto, that's a quote, as one militant put it, Earlier Jewish wealth had all been stripped from the backs of the slaves. You see that symmetry. As part of the effort to de-victimize blacks, the NOI had turned the traditional white historical narrative on its head. Now Malcolm X determined that he also had to rewrite 
the recent historical record of the Jews. Black suffering had to be placed at the center of the American and world narratives, not the experience of the Jews. While characterizing Jews as deceitful, Malcolm X conjured up grossly inflated figures that diminished the Holocaust, now overshadowed by the dimensions of the Atlantic slave trade. Cannily invoking images of manipulative Jews, he pictured them, quote, always running around here trying to get you sympathetic for them, make you cry crocodile tears over what happened to him in Germany. Of course, the Holocaust was hardly confined to Germany. In response, quote, you tell them what happened to you right here. You haven't got no time to cry no tears for no Jew. And now he introduces audience to the new American foundation narrative he had fashioned that would supposedly liberate them. Quote, why? They only killed six million Jews. Only six million Jews were killed by Hitler. Uncle Sam killed a hundred million black people, bringing them here. Yeah, a hundred million, a hundred million. Don't let no Jew get up in your face and make you cry for him. Ask what happened when our forefathers were brought over here as slaves. A hundred million black people were taken from Africa, unquote. Occasionally, even in the same oration, the hundred million had been brought to, quote, the Western Hemisphere. But more often, he taught his riveted and credulous listeners that they were brought to this country, to the U.S. One hundred, quote, 100 million of us were kidnapped and brought to this country. 100 million. Now everybody's getting wet-eyed over a handful of Jews. What about our 100 million, unquote? Of the 100 million, Malcolm X claimed 80 million had been, quote, murdered, butchered, mutilated. And these Jews got the audacity to run around here and want you to cry for them. Malcolm X had formulated the new nationalist liturgy, and it became the gospel truth. The Atlantic slave trade had, in fact, involved uh, not 100 million, but between 10 million and 12 million Africans, and only 6% of them were brought to this country, to the U.S. And do the math, it means 600,000 to 720,000. Rather than 80 million dead in the Middle Passage, the death toll has been em uh, uh, estimated as at between 1.2 and 2.6 million. But none of this mattered. Stokely Carmichael charged in 1968 that, quote, 100 million niggers have been killed during the trip from Africa to America, unquote. And so African Americans were owned a homeland, were owed a homeland more than Jews. He proposed that, after all of this, what are you getting wet-eyed over a handful of Jews? Uh, he proposed that Zionists, quote, take the land from their home state of Germany. These people think that that's where Jews are from, right? Uh, not from the Arabs in the Middle East. More recently, in 2005, Malcolm X's namesake, Malik Zulu Shabazz, national chairman of the new Black Panther Party for Defense, has raised the stakes by 50%. Declaiming before a room filled to capacity at Carnegie Mellon University, quote, you say you lost six million, we lost 150 million, unquote. Like most other anti-Semites and anti-Zionists, they minimized the suffering of Jews. According to the adherents of the New Nationalist Bible, uh, and I think you get the point, but I want to wind up with this. According to the adherents of the New Nationalist Bible, there was no need to, quote, cry tears for no Jew, cry tears for yourself. For some, there was no need for a Jewish state because anti-Semitism and the victimization of the Jews were confined to four years. While blacks have been subjected to, quote, 400 years of lynchings here. With the new paradigm, which trained the lens only on the suffering of non-whites, with this sleight of hand, two millennia, two millennia of the oppression of Jews by the world's oldest and longest hatred were erased. The new nationalists also employed the methods used by anti-Semites down through the ages, and more recently by anti-Zionists as well, to handle parts of themselves or their societies they need to disavow by attaching them, projecting them instead onto the Jew or the Jewish state. Thus Malcolm X taught that Jews did not deserve his followers' sympathy for the Holocaust because the Jews, quote, brought it on 
themselves, unquote. Jews bear the responsibility for the annihilation. Without Jews' cooperation with the Nazis, the Holocaust could never have taken place. As Stokely Carmichael put it, quote, the Jews were the ones carrying out the orders so the Nazis could say it's not us, it's the Jews. And then they pulled the Uncle Tom Jews up, unquote. He called on black people to, quote, check out the difference between us and the Jews when the Nazis started to commit genocide against them, unquote. Although this egregious comparison has had very long legs among the many admirers of Malcolm X over the last half century, they almost never even mention all the black Africans who facilitated the Atlantic slave trade, who staged all the raids to capture the slaves, and who brought those captives overland to the white slave traders waiting on the coast. It is without them, the African slavers, that the African slave trade may not have taken place. The anti-Zionism, uh, the anti-Semitism of this anti-Zionist was clear. And so, people, the black nationalist rewrote the history of America and the world uh, from the anti-Semitic point of view. And I don't have the time, but uh, the students wrote papers still just accepting this chapter and verse. Okay, well, I think we had a, a pretty explosive and uh, passionate expose. Um, and, and both of these papers, I think, uh, really are bound to provoke uh, some comments and questions. And now it's your opportunity. Hi, uh, Pinchas Richard Wimberley. I, you okay, Toby? I, I found both of your talks uh, informative, uh, but I'm going to ask a question only to uh, one per person. Um, you talk about Butler to Valenson or something like that. What is his name? Ba ba the presidents of Columbia University. And as you're talking about the presidents of Columbia University, I'm reminded that right after the Second World War, the commander in chief of the, uh, of the Allied effort against uh, Hitler, Dwight David Eisenhower, was also made president of Columbia University. And I, I'm wondering if, if that's a reaction or if there's some other factor or just the fact that he was a great man. Uh, did, you, did you get involved at all with that question as to why he would become the president of Columbia no, University? No, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with a reaction uh, to uh, about any concern with uh, Columbia's record on the Nazis. That, that just is not an issue that's discussed in, in appointing him and was not a factor in considering him. There are other factors, but that, that wasn't one of them. My name is Toby Willick. I want to ask about the Arab and uh, Muslim studies in the various universities. What are their restrictions? Of course, uh, are they subject to... Uh, donations from various countries which have no limitations, and how effective have they been now in the present time in fostering uh, their agenda of uh, anti-Israel, anti-Jewish uh, hatred? Of course, they have a, a great deal of the money does come from, for uh, endowed chairs, comes from Arab nations. So it's only occasionally denied if they can be traced to people who of uh, Holocaust Denial Foundations. But uh, they're tremendously effective, and they are the heritors, if you will, of the legacy of the uh, black student movement. And so these are the people who are seen as champions of uh, anti-racism. So I think that uh, the blacks, in this earlier period, uh, legitimated anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism on campus. I think anti-Semitism is the independent variable. And these people have had a much easier route because the blacks so legitimated anti-Semitism. I just want to commend you for, I think, a very courageous presentation, by the way. Thank you. I really appreciate it. 
uh, Ruth and Liebman, of course, I uh, second uh, Toby's uh, uh, feelings about this. Uh, just a few uh, brief comments. Uh, today, Israelis and maybe also uh, supporters of Israel overseas in other countries um, talk about um, how pathetic our PR is or uh, public uh, di diplomacy. Uh, it appears that things haven't haven't really changed, and uh, of, of course it's it's amazing that all this hasn't really been known to the majority of, of, of people. But when we when you hear this wonderful this fascinating talk about the role of of the of the Ivory uh, League uh, universities and the Seven Sisters and others um, towards uh, their attitude towards the the, the Nazis. Um, it wasn't only the, their attitude towards the Nazis. I mean, they, they had the same attitude towards uh, the, the Japanese uh, and uh, towards M Mussolini and, 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 and Franco. And then, of course, later on, I mean, uh, together with the State Department, I mean, buddy-buddy with, with, with uh, Saddam Hussein and so forth. So history re re repeats itself. They never learn from, from, from experience. And as far as the black Americans, I mean, how... So why is it that the mainstream of, of black leaders were so silent that those who really made the black community, who set up the NACCP, uh, were Jews like um, uh, Ro uh, Julius Rosenwald, uh, I think, who um, was also anti-Zionist, by the way, um, and, and, and a lot of others. I mean, isn't there anyone that has any decency among the black community that can really straighten the picture? Thank you. Let me just say one thing over here. Uh, I, I agree with you about the tepid response, but it's much more than that. Uh, in, in 2004, Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan announced, oh sorry, in 2004, Louis Farrakhan announced that 75% of the slaves in the Old South were owned by Jews. People, the real figure I've calculated is uh, about two tenths of one percent. Okay, so not seventy-five percent, but two tenths of one percent. But the NAACP, and that's about as traditional as one can get. The NAACP director of communications, we're talking about, uh, uh, responded to that. Uh, well, Farrakhan quote may have exaggerated the historical fact, but that's a matter for academics to debate. In other words, this was totally credible to him. So that's the uh, role of the establishment today. Uh, well, uh, there. The uh, blacks have uh, been so out front in being so, I was tell telling Robert before, uh, so anti Semitic and uh, justifying their anti Semitism and anti Zionism that I've just read an article in an Arab American uh, newspaper that said they could not believe that Martin Luther King could have ever said anything positive about uh, Zionism or Jews. In other words, they're just, <laughs> these are the people who have taken over the record. I mean, we could talk about why the blacks did this, why the black nationalists originally did this. Uh, the black nationalists wanted to discredit the, in the integrationist movement. Uh, Malcolm X called the March on Washington, which was uh, August 28th, 1963. You know, Mar Martin Luther King was one of the leaders. Malcolm X called it the farce on Washington. The uh, black nationalists are black separatists. They don't believe in integration. They wanted to discredit integration. And the way to discredit integration, of course, is to discredit the leading whites in the integrationist movement is the Jews. And how better to discredit them by saying <laughs> they're hiding, <laughs> that they're really Nazis, and these are the people who really dominated the slave trade. Again, nothing that could be, fa that could be farther from the truth. Jakob Fogelman. Uh, you're just mentioning Martin Luther King brings to mind another problem just as severe and interconnected with the academic bias against Jews in America, England, and so forth is the Israeli academics who join them. And a, a classic example, I'll just give two instances, was uh, this university which invited <coughs> Martin Luther King's son a few years back to give a talk on his father. So I went to Truman Institute, and I thought that would be a good thing to know about. And suddenly this mysterious guest, though the president of the university was sitting at the dais, the mysterious guest was the Moonies. 
a group of Moonies led by Mooney's son, Reverend Moon's son, who were violently anti-Israel, and they took over the evening. I just couldn't understand how it happened. I wrote about it, and so did the uh, Haaretz newspaper. And it turned out when I interviewed the person in charge of Truman, he said, well, we're not like a big university with loads of funds. I think the funds are here, actually. But we're, we're just a poor university, and if someone's willing to give money to sponsor something, we will do it. So that happened here a few years back at the Truman Institute. And many speakers here are quite clearly pro-Palestinian and will constantly condemn Israel. This university, Haifa University. And the second incident was at Israel's leading think tank, Van Leer, a few weeks ago. I went to a session devoted to discussing the Israeli-Palestinian question. And the speakers, who are very sophisticated, with beautiful uh, academic language, and very abstract ideas, but they refer to our need to apologize for our Holocaust upon the Arabs. And that's just two examples of what I sense here, of people who are basically not good, not loving of their own people, or themselves maybe, who use academic credentials as a way to razzle-dazzle everybody else. Well, you know, th th that's really good. They were taught to uh, suspect, to dismiss, all the white academics or Jewish academics points of view. And so therefore, and they were taught that you have to, all these black leaders write at Ebony, for example, that uh, you have to rewrite history. And so they basically invited the students to do that. And that's why they brought in a lot of these charlatans on whom the students uh, conferred, if you will, uh, degrees of doctor, always doctor this. And they meant it very sincerely. These were the people, even though the people had barely gone to college, uh, but these were the people who were going to tell the truth that's been obscured from them. So uh, when the American Historical Association came out with this resolution on Jews and slavery that showed how minimal a role the Jews had, they just dismissed it. That's just the establishment's uh, speaking, is it? hiding the truth. It's very hard to get through. It's very hard to penetrate. I, I personally think as an observant Jew, there are a lot of the anti-Jewish, Jewish reactions that I begin with are because they have a certain bottle. They don't want to recognize God, which is on the mission historically. And that they made themselves, and they gave themselves their beliefs. And that lack of humility, I think, is very closely involved, at least on the unconscious level. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Francoise Ouzan. Um, congratulations for your very rich, both of you, very rich uh, lectures. Um, my first question addresses Professor Polak. Um, and maybe in 1994, you may remember that uh, the governor of uh, New Jersey invited uh, Louis Farrakhan to um, watch the film, The Schindler's List, which, ha which had just appeared. And, uh, well, he actually refused, but sent someone mm -hmm. <laughs> there. Yes. And uh, one of the uh, journalists actually rejoiced that it has had an impression on his, uh, on his uh, son. On the, I don't remember exactly the name of the person who was an envoy of Farrakhan. But um, in the end, and that confirms what you said, Holocaust denial was uh, even enhanced <laughs> because the conclusion was that uh, there is no comparison with their so-called holo black holocaust. But my question is um, the following. Uh, would you think that the Schindler's List has had any impact, or on the contrary, has it nurtured the, um, the, the, well, the bias and the uh, actual uh, controversy? Uh, that's for your uh, question. And Okay. Sorry, oh. and I have another question, okay. but maybe... Let me first answer that. Yes. I just uh, could answer it briefly. Uh, the answer is, of course, not. But in the same year, uh, they were also... I think the guy was uh, Khalid Abdul Muhammad. Yeah, that's that, right. Right. And uh, he and Leonard Jeffries and also uh, Tony Martin, th these people were brought, actually, to the Holocaust Memorial Museum mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. And Khalid Abdul Muhammad's comment when he came out was, uh, uh, he remains unimpressed. Uh, as he remarked, they had piles of shoes. We didn't even have shoes. <laughs> Understand? I mean, it's just uh, impossible. Yeah. And notably, uh, his audiences knew so little of the history of Jews 
that when he informed Khalid Abdul Muhammad regaled his Howard audiences, university students, saying that Jews were never stripped of their names, their culture, their religion, their land, their family, like black people were. No one dissented. By now, it all seemed credible to them. The, the task is enormous, a yeah. lot more than and yet, bonus. And yet, on the other hand, but that's totally, uh, a totally different point of view, there's Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, uh, what's her name? Oprah Winfrey, Oprah, right. Yes, who actually oh, yeah. admitted at the same period that she has become better now that she has watched the Schindler's List you don't, uh, don't there's no way to see any interaction. It has had no influence, I guess. Thank you. So my second question addresses um, you. Um, and um, I was wondering whether you have uh, fathomed the archives of West Point. And as far as um, the penetration of anti-Semitism, ha have you seen any similitude between the penetration of Nazi ideas um, in the university and in uh, West Point, the military yeah, academy. The service academies are pervaded with anti-Semitism during the 1930s. Uh, and there has been some work on this, jo Joseph Bendersky's book on uh, the army and anti-Semitism reveals a uh, considerable amount of uh, anti-Semitic thinking uh, in high places in the American military during the 1930s, an anti-Semitic lecturer is invited to the Army War College. This is well documented. Uh, one of the things I came up with in my research was that the United States Naval Academy in, in Annapolis uh, during the 1930s uh, warmly received a, uh, <clears throat> the uh, officers and crew of uh, Nazi uh, warship. And, uh, had a very friendly reception for them. Uh, so, uh, and this type of uh, anti-Semitism uh, did continue to be a problem uh, in World War II. And, and particularly, uh, you're going to see this in the immediate post-World War II period, <clears throat> where a lot of uh, top leaders of the American military express enormous contempt uh, and uh, outright hatred of uh, Jewish displaced persons mm -hmm. uh, in the camps. Uh, Holocaust survivors are abused. Um, uh, President uh, General Truman's Patton. emissary. General Patton's Patton. a classic case mm -hmm. of uh, fanatical anti-Semitism. Bedell Smith as well. In, in a high place. Uh, there, there are quite a number of uh, uh, people like that. And the, the, the Holocaust survivors were treated in... Uh, a horrible fashion in, in many, many cases. In the DP camps, um, there were comments by President Truman's. By who? Uh, President by Truman sent an uh, emissary yeah. to check out the situation in Harrison. the immediate post-war yeah. war period. Right, and, and who uh, commented something to the effect that uh, we were treating the, I mean, the Americans, the Jews, like the Nazis, Nazis had, except we were not exterminating them. They were often confined in concentration camps, wearing concentration camp uniforms, mm -hmm. and uh, just treated with contempt, often under the supervision of German guards who had been brought in by the United States Army. Um, so, um, When did, did you think it actually um, came to a decline, if it has ever come? <laughs> Well, it's still a serious problem. Uh, it's still problem a serious and, problem. And not, not as much as it was then. Of course, there, there's the, the scandal at the United States Air Force Academy about uh, Christian proselytizing being conducted openly. Uh, that's been the subject of many newspaper articles recently. Um, but it, it, it's certainly not as intense as it was during the World War II and immediate post-war period when it was quite intense in the American military and, and in the Navy. Thank yeah. you very much. If I could just uh, introduce uh, up to the present day uh, about Helen Thomas saying uh, uh, the Jews should get out of Palestine, you know, uh, that ended her career. Um, 
I, I, I would like, if I may, just to ask one final, admittedly provocative question to both of you for a comment, brief comment. Um, what would you say about <coughs> the fact that the United States today has a president, the first black president, or at least partly black president in its history, and some people would say perhaps the most unfriendly uh, towards Israel in, the, in living memory and perhaps <laughs> ever. And given the fact that, as we know, his own pastor, Jeremiah Wright, uh, was somebody quite close to many of the attitudes that you had described in your presentation. And given that Rashid Khalidi was one of his uh, mentors and certainly sources for his view of the Middle East, in the light of both of these talks, would you venture to say something about uh, you know, President Obama's uh, take on Israel in particular, but perhaps also in a more um, ambivalent way on Jews? I can't believe you're doing this to me, first of all. But uh, let, let me just uh, try to evade that a little bit. But of course, I mean, Farrakhan, uh, I mean, the relation is direct. Uh, Jeremiah Wright gave an honorary some great honor to Farrakhan. They're all involved in Chicago. They're all coming out of Chicago. And I often thought that the way, what you couldn't write something is, you know, Khalid Abdul Muhammad, from Khalid to Khalidi. I thought that would be a good uh, thing. But uh, I, I would like to know what he uh, reads. Uh, I mean, he was also, I mean, he was, I mean, I can't really say it on, can't, I can't. Uh, so, I, I mean, that's not the only thing that influences Barack Obama. I think he had a lot of uh, Jewish friends, but of course the question is what kind of Jewish friends, <laughs> you know. So uh, I don't know, maybe, who knows? <laughs> but uh, I'm sure that those things influenced him a great deal. But I don't know how often he hung around, you know, black uh, bookstores, which are filled with, all, with this, you know? So I'm not sure to what degree. It, you're just putting me on the spot, <laughs> and I'm finding it difficult to say my true thoughts to you on, on the camera. That's it, you know? As soon as the camera lens on, I'll talk. But uh, I find it difficult to, I mean, it, it was courageous, as you said. I mean, no one should do suicide. Academic suicide. Uh, fair, fair enough. Um, how about you, Steve? Do you want to commit uh, academic suicide? <laughs> no, I don't care about uh, you may not, you may not that. But yeah, you're asking me, uh, do I think that Obama was influenced by uh, some, of, some of the unsavory people that he did associate with? Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, I do have concern about his Middle East policy, and, and um, th there's a, an anti-Israel bias that has been evident. Uh, I'm uncomfortable with uh, many of the people that he's associated with, but um, there's also a larger problem about um, people in the mainstream of American political life uh, being unwilling to condemn anti-Semitism when it shows its face. And I think of the so-called Million Man March in 1995, where the American mainstream news media covered it like it was a serious political rally, and uh, not an occasion where we saw the distribution of massive quantities of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and the secret relationship between blacks and Jews. and. Uh, a dangerous extremist and hate monger being given a national platform on television. That should have been, been the occasion uh, for a stinging criticism to have been directed uh, at him and, and, and his rally uh, by the American mainstream news media and by the President of the United States. And uh, that didn't happen. So I think the problem is uh, larger than one involving President Obama. Um, uh, revealing um, that he's possibly not going to be uh, sufficiently committed to Israel uh, uh, if there is a crisis and Israel is endangered.
to have them uh, turn certain feelings into action and to obtain political power so that they can do so. So from that background alone, he would tend to be someone who would uh, have the feelings of the black community very much in heart and act accordingly. In addition, he lived in for 20 years as a good member of the church that Reverend Rice ran. For 20 years, he listened to the most anti-Israel, anti-Semitic diatribes, diatribes that you could ever hear. And he said he uh, didn't absorb it, but obviously even on the question of osmosis, of sitting there in sleep, you would have had to absorb for 20 years what somebody said every single Sunday. That indeed was the point of my question, but I think we'll have to leave it there. <laughs> we'll have to leave it there, and my uh, sincerest thanks to our two speakers for their splendid contributions this evening.